Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. This is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for August 9th, 2022. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is the webcast and podcast that digs deep into the clutter that piles up between you and the life you want to be living. We explore the habits and behaviors that lead to clutter, and we suggest strategies to slow the accumulation reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we decide to keep. Right. If you're new to our Zoom meeting, we want to let you know that you can share your comments and questions via the chat feature, and I'll try to make sure Gail gets to them before we move on to another topic. You can also use the raise hand feature if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question yourself via audio or video. We're also streaming on Facebook, so you can ask us questions and leave us comments there as well, and we will I will relay them to Gail. We're going to start, as usual, by talking about last week's weekly tittle, which was called Clear Space to Work. We talked about we were talking about home offices and spaces dedicated to office type work at home. And the trouble that they cause. <laughs> right. And the assignment was to clear your desktop or whatever other surface is the primary place where you carry out office work tasks at home. We'd love to hear from our participants in Zoom and Facebook. Who managed to clear the desk or maybe the dining room table this week? Please let us know in the comments. YouTube viewer AZ had this to share on the home office topic. I have a lot of pens. I don't know how many, not 100. <laughs> <laughs> when I sold my house, I kept all the nice ones that work. I use them daily. I like a nice pen and I like having different colors available for highlighting important info. I live in a studio and use a hanging jewelry organizer with many zippered pockets for office supplies and pens. Thanks for the great tip about the hanging jewelry organizer, by the way. We've talked about repurposing other hanging organizers to store stuff other than what they're designed for, like using the shoe organizer for the small electronics and office supplies. But a jewelry organizer is a great solution if you have a collection of any sort of small things that you want to keep visible and easy to access. Uh, we posted an item on our website about a hanging jewelry organizer of the type that we're talking about. So you can visit cfhou.com slash jewelry to check it out. It is a, um, a small one with a hook on it that's designed to fold up and travel and then unroll and hang somewhere. And but so it's like a micro version of the shoe thing. And uh, it's, it would be great for office supplies. I can see why you would put pins in it. Um, even if they were just standing up in the pocket. So great, great idea. I hadn't really ever thought to make that, um, you know, uh, change in purpose for a jewelry organizer, but that's a great idea. Yeah, we've talked about the bigger ones, shoe, <laughs> yeah. shoe organizers and such. Mm -hmm. I wanted to add something too in response to AZ. We had a very lively conversation <laughs> last week on the topic of pens. And yes. <laughs> uh, I especially gently teased our audience about the size of some of their pen collections. <laughs> and, you know, Gail and I try to keep our tone very light. And we hope you always know that we're laughing with you, not at you. Yes. <laughs> even if you're not quite laughing. <laughs> AZ's comment is a great reminder, though, that as far as the Clutter Fairy is concerned, something only becomes clutter if it gets in the way of the life you want to be living, the things you want to be doing. That means if you have 100 pens, but they all work and you love them and you use them, you should definitely feel free to keep them. Right. We always we want to make sure that um, you understand that we are here to support you in accomplishing what you, how you want to be in your space and not have judgment about what you decide to keep. We really don't care what you keep. We just care whether you can manage and live with and be comfortable in what you keep. And that's all, that's all why we talk about this stuff. So thank you. And, <laughs> and we hope that you know that we are just trying to have fun here. So we don't want to be, we're not trying to be judgmental while we laugh. Right. We don't want to bully anyone. <laughs> no, no. Well, one of the Debras in the meeting said, I got rid of some junk mail, tried to Yay! call a number. So the junk mail would stop coming. Um, she didn't say whether she was successful with that. Um, mm -hmm. Cool. Good M, try. M said, my work area is ugly with tangles of tang tangles of cords, but no food, trash, etc. Then I realized this is the dining room table. I can't even get to the desk. Oh, <laughs> well, there that that might um, require a redesign. Then it sounds like there's a, something to be addressed there. 
and maybe you added the desk in later, or maybe you added the dining room table in later, and you didn't go about the purpose of, uh, about the idea of resetting the whole room just to make it do what you want to do. So, if the room has evolved over time and you've added furniture to um, address added uh, functions in there, then maybe it's time to stop and go pretend like I've moved and I've just moved into this room. What do I want this room to do? And reset it to support what you're doing there. Joyce said, I attempted the tittle by opening the door to my home office, putting a small pile in recycling and shredded until the overheat button turned on. Baby, <laughs> baby steps. Right, baby steps. And, you know, those home shredders are not designed for huge projects and overheating them just um, helps them die faster. So you may want to consider bagging, shredding and taking it somewhere. Now it is an extra chore that you have to drive but it takes a long time to shred things by hand. So um, there's always a business, a shredding business close by that has public days and you can take, you know, they have rules about, we take three boxes, we take five boxes, whatever, and charge you a little bit of money and they can do the shredding in 30 minutes and not kill the machine. So um, if you have a whole lot of shredding, I would find a bulk solution that doesn't require you to spend hours and hours putting paper through a little bitty baby shredder. Yeah. Just saying. <laughs> I have killed many a home shredder at people's houses because they've insisted that we do the shredding on site. And then the hundred dollar shredder gets killed because uh, we're burning years and years and years of shredding that has been being put off all this time. And, and then we kill the machine. So if you're going to kill the machine and have to go buy another hundred dollar shredder anyway, <laughs> You might as well go spend fifty dollars at the shred place and keep your shredder. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Anya said today I decided to let one tech item go when I get home on Friday. Woohoo! She's that's a good she's one. Vacationing. Oh, and that she reminded me actually. She, she said she's she's vacationing in the country mm. with um, what where she sees what, horses and wildlife. Oh, and that nice. reminded me, I, I, I'm afraid I don't remember who said this, but a, a great tip that was in YouTube comments was we, we talked last week about calendars and how much you hate to let go of old calendars, but like yeah. the old, old wildlife calendars and things, someone suggested cutting them up and using them as disposable placemats for eating outside. You know, like if you have a mm. table that is where things fall through, where food falls through, you know, yeah, we have a, yeah, we have yeah, an yeah. outdoor table, like patio table like that. And so not, you know, fun, colorful placemats. For right. Outdoor dining. To go with your paper plates, you can use a right. paper placemat and then you can recycle it all. That's a great yeah. idea. I like that. And you can look at pretty pictures while you have dinner outside. That works. Dar Darby said, I had my kids clear off their desks because school mm -hmm. started Monday. That's great. Oh, if, you could, if you could delegate the tit tittle, that's even better. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I, but it's perfect that you did it right before school so they could like they have a clean um, workspace to get started because they're it's a new school year for them, too. And so having a clean space to get started, they're going to slowly um, clutter it over the school year. But you can occasionally go in them and have them reset it. Good for you. Connie said, I told DH about last week and he started on his desk. I'm aghast. The ah! foot high, the foot high piles are half of what they used to be. Hey, that's cool. That's awesome. See, he just needed some positive reinforcement, right? That's awesome. I hope Pat, he keeps going. Pat reports two boxes of tech cords gone. Yay! Tech cords are just the hardest thing. They always seem like their their function is so simple, and they seem like they would be so useful, except that. They really aren't, and you really don't know what they're for. <laughs> they really need to go. And so throwing them away is always like, oh, it makes people cringe. But if you can do it, good for you. And Connie also started on her desk in the bedroom and is halfway done there, too. Good job. Y'all are cranking on it. Excellent. On the That's subject of jewelry that we talked about a few minutes ago, Janet mm -hmm. said, I use, I use dollar store ice cube trays for jewelry. Oh, I have seen that before. And, um, and the only thing that worries me about them is that they're very delicate and lightweight. And if you accidentally bump it or click it or twitch it or <laughs> the stuff all goes flying. So 
Um, if you're going to use them, then if you have pets, you need to consider that they it sits somewhere that the pet can't walk, touch, bump, stand on it, and dump it over. And um, you might see about if you're going to park it some space space specific on a bookshelf, on a counter, or something. Maybe you can get some double stick tape and tape it down so it can't jump just by accident. And then the stuff is more likely to stay in the compartments. That's the only downside of those things is they're super lightweight. And so when you fill them all in, if you accidentally, you know, bump it, things jump out. <laughs> so just to keep that in mind. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think we should get to our main topic because we okay. have, I'll, there's so much in the chat and I'll, I'll get back to more of it later, but um, we're going to talk today about common areas. Most homes have at least one space that's shared by the whole family, the living room, sitting room, den, great room, family room, et cetera. Whether formal or casual, these common rooms see lots of traffic and may serve many roles. So they're prone to clutter collection. Today, we're gonna to examine the challenges in common areas of the home and Gail will offer advice for optimizing shared space for your family's comfort and enjoyment. So we're talking about those common areas, the rooms that are shared by the whole family, as well as visitors and guests to your home. So we started off the survey by asking a question designed to show us the landscape of the spaces that, that you, our audience, are using, how you're using them. And your answers told us a whole lot more than we expected. Many of our respondents have a living room, that's 78%. And 9% listed sitting rooms, which we, um, which is what we understand the UK audience would generally call what Americans call a living room. So if you combine that, it's like a lot, <laughs> 87% of everybody has some kind of living room. 52% have a dining room, and there's also plenty of family rooms at 22%. But besides those expected responses, we saw some interesting answers that reflect newer trends in home design. 16% report having great rooms, bonus rooms, or other open concept areas that defy the strict cate categorization of traditional names. So it's one great big room that's got a lot of it going on, and it's all open, no walls, that kind of stuff. Several reported having a combination living dining room, and quite a few people live in small spaces like studio apartments where a single room serves all the main functions other than the bathroom. So it's basically one room. We're doing it all in here. Those, those rooms are always a challenge in every way, right? Survey respondents also listed the following rooms that we didn't mention. So foyers and entryways, which I guess is a common area, studies, music rooms, sunrooms, finished basements, sewing rooms, garage apartments, breakfast nooks, and we even had a listing for a tattoo studio. So <laughs> that's a new common area function. I have not encountered a tattoo studio as a common area function, but you know, whatever works, right? So a lot of these rooms surprise me as rooms that were listed as common areas, but I suppose if you have a mu music room and you have people coming over to play music with you, going and sitting with guests in the music room makes sense. Um, a, a finished basement might make a, like that's an alternative den kind of area. And so I can see how these would be extra rooms that would be receiving guests occasionally. So here's what you're doing here. Um, the top four responses about the functions of the common area were watching TV or movies, that's 77%. So everybody's um, getting entertained in these common areas. We're all snacking. There's 73% of us that are snacking in the common areas and 71% that are reading. So clearly this is the leisure activity area. 69% uh, in, in, in addition to snacking, 69% are actually eating meals. So there's a, a lot more than the number of the dining rooms that we got. So I think a lot of people are eating in the living room while they're watching the television or snack reading or whatever. So um, we've sort of moved out of traditionally sitting in the dining room and a lot of us are sitting in the, the living room slash sitting room uh, to have some meals, which is not a surprise to me. We all like to eat with the TV. The next most popular responses were um, entertaining guests in these rooms, which we would hope that's the purpose of it sometimes. Um, handling mail was a surprise. Listening to music makes sense and managing finances or paperwork 
was the other surprise to me and napping about only about a third of the respondents said that they have a common room that's shared by family, but not with visitors. So I'm assuming sometimes the bonus room or the finished basement, something like that, you wouldn't take guests down into those areas, but the family would relax in them anyway. And 60% said that the room or area where they'd entertain is not ready for visitors at this moment. So um, there's a lot of, uh, <laughs> we did get a lot of interesting answers in, in the department of it's not ready for entertaining guests, but <laughs> yes, but so we've got some really great responses from you guys. Thanks again for everybody participating. We love that. Um, we asked what leads to clutter in this room and the answers were not surprising. Uh, leaving things out, everybody leaves things out and then it makes clutter and they don't like it. Uh, there's on a storage in these common areas and typically they're not designed with a lot of storage because that's not how they're supposed to be used. So um, there's you're short in storage and you find that annoying and it leads to clutter in the room. Uh, not putting things where they belong was one of the responses. And uh, we did see that the uh, you were throwing your family under the bus a lot about that. <laughs> my husband, my kids, my, they don't put stuff away. They don't want to put stuff away. They, they are annoyed by the stuff. Um, they're annoyed by the process of putting things away. And so it sounded like there are some family members that want the room to be guest ready and some that can't be bothered. And so there's some conflict there between uh, a cooperation among uh, everybody that's using the family room. And that doesn't surprise me. And so that process leads to clutter. Um, this is something that I call um, the command post. If you have a place where you normally sit and there's usually here's the seat and here's the table or something next to you where with the lamp or the remote control, it's also usually got a bunch of other stuff on it too. If you are actively sitting there all the time, then there's usually some kind of table or space next to you that gets buried in stuff. And so it becomes the, these are the pills that I take every night, or these are the, this is the book that I'm reading, or this is the mail that I looked at today, or I always have to process this piece of paper. And so I leave it here and here's the TV guide. <laughs> That's I'm dating myself with that, but there's always a collection of things that become necessary to support you sitting and relaxing in the same place all the time. And I think of that space as the command post. I laugh about my dad used to have a chair. He would always has a chair and it's usually some kind of recliner and he would have the trash can and he would have the newspaper and he would have the iPad and he had the, the towel from because he eats when he's sitting in the chair and here's the, the tray that has all the remote controls in it. And there's always a bunch of stuff right around him. And, and it's been that way my entire life. He's always had a command post. And so having that, parking space that is your seat that you sit in all the time is always surrounded by all the things you want to have right there while you're sitting there and keeping that clean is always a problem and then you know in general what leads to clutter in this room everybody there's a whole bunch of versions of I still have too much stuff there's still too much stuff in this room too much furniture too much objects too much knickknacks there was all kinds of versions of I still have too much stuff and so yeah, that's the whole point of this podcast is to talk about too much stuff and getting rid of some of it. So, <laughs> so we're all in agreement on that one. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about what, how I think that the, this common area living room should function and how it could work better for you. I think the first thing to, add, to talk about is that you need to have easy access storage in there that allows you to hide the things that you're regularly going to use in that room. So the goal, if the goal is, I'm assuming, if the goal is to keep this public area presentable so that anyone that comes over can come into this room and you don't feel, you know, a wash of shame every time somebody walks in that room, you don't need to be feeling uncomfortable when somebody comes in. And so if that's the goal, peaceful um, arrival of guests without shame or panic, <laughs> then there are certain things that get used in that room that need to be stored. And so having a little bit of easy access storage just to hide the regularly used items, like here's the little thing to put the uh, all of the 
remote controls in so they're not just randomly sitting around. Here is the um, coffee table that actually has a lift up lid that's storage or a bench that has a lift up lid that you can put uh, a few blankets in or something along that line. Here's the TV cabinet where the DVDs stay or the game boy, you know, the all the game cartridges stay if you don't want them all laying out and around. So you have to assess the items that you actually use in there all the time, figure out what they are, and then figure out where they can be parked. And adding furniture in this room is always a difficult decision. You don't want to add too much furniture to make it be difficult. And I'll talk that in, about that in a minute. But generally, you want to have a few dual purpose things. I can still sit on this and have a have a parking space next to it. This is some place that I can uh, put down a snack tray or whatever, some kind of coffee table, end table, side table that I can store a few things in. I can open cabinet doors and stick things inside. Here's a bookshelf and I can put things up on top of it that um, I mean on the shelves that allows me to put these things out of the way when I'm not using them. The things that are stored in this room should actually be used in this room. So one of the things that causes a problem in these common areas is that there's a lot of activity in the room. And so sometimes the activity means that things flow into the room and they never kind of flow out. Like things get carried in because everybody's coming in there or there's lots of foot traffic through that room and things get parked in that room that don't really have anything to do with being in that room. And so if you imagine the purposes for that room and generally they are relaxation and entertainment and including or not including guests. So based on what you actually want to do in that room, we're going to let, and your response has said, we eat in there, we watch TV in there, we're reading books in there. And so, and, and craft and hobbies, there, there was a lot of craft and hobby, about 30% said that they were doing a craft or a hobby in there. Again, because they're wanting to craft in company with the other people in the household while watching the television. So um, totally get that. But making a space to accommodate what you're doing in there and being able to put away the supplies when something somebody comes over is a goal to have for this room so that you don't have a bunch of stuff that you're not doing in that room. You're not using that room to store because it's you got an open floor space or because that's where the bookshelf is. You want to only store and manage the things that you're actually going to do in that living room. And the reason I say that it's different from other rooms in the house, because a, you're going to have guests in, in theory. And if you have guests in, then you don't need them to be sort of wiggling in between your day, all of your daily life. And if you want people to be able to sit down and function in there, you have to have the space for it. So um, anything that doesn't have to live in there should go out, find a new parking space for it. And um, anything that is good in there, you need to create a storage parking space for it so that things can be put up. Yes, sir. Connie mentions our living slash dining room is also the museum. The museum? Well, yeah. So that's where you display, you know, the, the parts of your life that you want publicly visible. You know, I, I'm thinking that means, you know, your, your coolest stuff, the mementos, family the photos, maybe family artwork. photos, your, yeah. Okay, so A, I get that, that you're using here's decor and here's tchotchkes and collections that need to go in there. So then the question becomes, how much of the room do you want to give over to collection displays? And it may be that if you have 100 Star Wars figurines, probably not the best place to put it. Maybe you're going to put 10 of them and that's a volume that somebody can look at, but 100 of them is too overwhelming for the room. So this is, this is a room more than any other room where less is more and finding a place to park it all in the room is going to add to the visual clutter. It's going to add to the, the dusting chores. It's going to add to the, what you have to do to reset the room or clean it up. And so if you, we talk about the representative sample a lot, keeping the representative sample and in this context, I would say that 
displaying the representative sample is the better choice than having the whole collection out, that you have the 25 coolest pieces or the 10 coolest pieces that you have right now, that that's what's on display, that that's how you, what you get to look at. And then the rest is away somewhere else. I have a, a, you know, I have a bead room. My living room is half and half. And so obviously half of my room is completely furniture and fixtures, desks, bookshelves, all kinds of stuff to support the beading. But there is a delineation between the two. So half the room is one thing, half the room is a living room. So people can come in and sit down in my living room, but in the, in the bead room is behind them. <laughs> so um, would I pass Martha Stewart? No, I would not but there's still an unimpeded living room area for people to come and sit down in my house. And that's how I share my hobby with my ability to receive guests. And you can do the same. I will say that a lot of people said that they were processing mail, processing paperwork, paying bills, like 54% of you are handling mail and bills there. And another 28% of you are doing professional work. So you're like actually working in the common area. So this may be a function of, uh, you know, COVID leftovers where people started working from home and the, the living room was the available space to put a desk surface, but handling the mail and paying bills in there, I get it because it's on the couch and you can do it in front of the television, all that stuff. But then it means that paper clutter is easily generated there and hard to manage there. And it's also hard to quickly gather up a bunch of paper and get it out of the way of guests. And so it's really, it, you know, it, it makes it difficult for your own privacy. If all the mail is out and people are looking at all your bills and if you sorted the work and you haven't finished the paying the bills, you haven't finished processing the mail and you've got it all sorted out and then somebody shows up and then you have to pick it all up and put it away and you've um, you know, destroyed your work there. And so it's a difficult place to do that stuff and manage it. It requires a little bit more active management. It can be done, but then if you're gonna do that kind of work there, then A, you should have a station there to support you and B, you should have a parking space to put it away. And you have to probably be much more diligent about getting to the end, doing the final cleanup, putting everything away, going and filing stuff to get it out of the living room area. If you can stay on top of it and keep processing and getting rid of the mail, recycling stuff, throwing things out regularly, going and filing things you're done with regularly. If you can circulate the paper quickly and regularly, you can probably stay on top of it. But if that's not your MO, if you don't do that very well, then doing mail and paper processing in this living area is always going to be a problem for you. It's always going to be creating clutter that makes it difficult for people to come over. So just a thought to juggle, you know, how badly do I need to do the bills in here versus um, I want to be able to reset and have my friends come over. And, um, you know, I would err on the side of friends so that you can have your friends come over and have it be fun and comfortable for them to visit. Speaking of which, um, you do have to have comfortable furniture in there that, so that people can sit and stay. It, usually you're having somebody come over, let's come watch a movie, come sit and talk to us. It's not going to be an in and out kind of thing. Typically they're coming for the evening and so they're going to be staying and you want it to be comfortable for them. So this room is someplace where you really want the seating to be useful, comfortable, easy to get in and out of. You want a place where you can manage drinks and snacks because you know everybody that comes over the first thing you do is offer them a drink or food and so you want there to be a place for them to put something down when they sit in a, in whatever chair or couch that is accessible for them so it's not a good place for a lot of excess furniture if you got people walking in and out in between the furniture and the coffee table and the intake like they got to be able to get around in there to get to the places to sit down and extra furniture, extra tables against the wall, the extra desk, the, you know, the second desk, the <laughs> boxes in the corner, all of that excess furniture and stuff in there crowds the walking paths. And it makes going in and around the furniture difficult for people to manage. And so in terms of having it be a comfortable place to sit and visit, A, you want good seating, but you don't want too much 
furniture in there that is going to make it difficult to get in the room. And so you got to strike a balance between their seating for enough people and there's not too much stuff for them to walk through crawl over. Um, you get used to uh, wedging yourself in between, but for other people, it's going to make them nervous if they feel like they're getting ready to bump something over or it's too crowded for them to walk through to get to the chair. So you have to consider how easy it is to navigate in there with the furniture you have. And maybe it's time to take some pieces out. I will say that this is a room that you should have a regular reset routine. So every night, every other night, you go in and pick up all the stuff and put things away and take the dishes back to the kitchen and you know, you walk the trash out. Like don't just keep a huge amount of trash in there before you take the trash out. This is a place where it makes sense to take the trash out of this room into the main trash can somewhere else regularly so that it's not a huge pile of trash in the room. If you're not somebody that is good at doing that at night like if you have the full day and you come home and you're tired and you come in and sit in there at night and you're doing your i'm resting i'm relaxing because it's the end of a long day then you can um make that reset happen in the morning instead if you're more of a morning person or you feel like you have better energy to focus on it in the morning great then put that into your morning routine that it's one of the things you go and pick up stuff and do the little general reset in the morning when you get up. Now, personally, <laughs> I hate to start my day that way. I don't have enough energy in the morning to do a bunch of cleaning before I get running out the door. So I tend to do it at night. But if you're more of a morning person and you got better energy and focus at that time, then make that reset happen when you feel at your best to accomplish it. You can also share this reset with other people in the household. And based on some of the responses that we got, this is an area of conflict People don't care. People don't want to reset it. People can't be bothered with the chore or whatever. And so um, negotiating on your own behalf for people to participate. I and mean, we've talked about uh, getting cooperation around this area before. And, you know, the kids live in the house. They can take dishes up before they go to bed. The husband lives in the house. Or what, you know, your spouse that doesn't want to participate can still, um, you guys can still have a negotiation about what part of this reset can you do? I'm not asking you to do all of it. This is a really important to me. I know it annoys you and it annoys everybody. Can you still do a, a part? And having that conversation, not while you're trying to reset, <laughs> but having it apart from that reset time um, so that you can negotiate who's doing what and when might help it make help you stick to a routine if you don't feel like you can do it every night because you're tired you know more than most of the other rooms we've talked about uh people mentioned stress and anxiety and arguments over common areas and i think maybe part of that is you know with the kitchen there's usually one person maybe two people who are the primary users of that users, room even yeah. though everybody uses that room there are one or two primary users and the living room um or a really active dining room that you use all the time everybody everybody uses it everybody shares it and so everybody should have a stake in it and and everybody has competing interests in it. right yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and everybody thinks the thing that someone else does in there is probably, you know, less important than the thing they do in there. Right. And yeah. And, so, and it's not true. <laughs> right. It seems like this may be, you know, the place where you really should have some conversation, maybe even family nego negotiation, family negotiation about this. Let's, can we all agree that these three or four things are what the living room is for. And, and, and we want to re and we want to be able to have the kids want to be able to have their friends over. The parents want to be able to have people over. And the, this is what we need to do to not be embarrassed when those people come. Pat said, my daughter and her family started a five minute evening reset. It may not get 100%, but it's always better. It's always better. And that's important because then if somebody calls and says, I'm coming over, then you have that much less to do, right? You can go and do the rest and, um, and still be comfortable about people coming over. That's great. And five minutes, you know, five minutes and everybody's participating. And so really 
you know, combined it's 15 minutes or 20 minutes, depending on how many people in the household. And, and that makes a difference. It really does. We as long as the room is set for that. We tended to have fire drills, I'm afraid, when I was a kid. You what know, do you mean? well, there were six of us, six kids. Oh my. And so, you know, the the family room particularly would get out of control, but then stuff would flow over into other rooms too. You know, you went in to do practice the piano and took stuff with you and it stayed there. The piano was in the living room. The formal, yeah. you know, we had a formal living room. Uh, uh, usually when I, when we were growing up and, you know, the fire, dr fire drill approach is so stressful for everyone. And uh, like, Oh my God, somebody's coming over. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> oh, what I think is great about what Pat said is, you know, a five minute evening reset. Well, that's, that's cultivating a habit mm -hmm. and cultivating a good habit the whole family participates in for five minutes man that that's powerful and it's also you're not doing it under the duress of any minute now my friend's knocking on the front door right so it does take the fire drill aspect out of it yeah where no we're not in panic we're just going in the room to clean for five minutes and so it's it's got to be less stressful right like that right. that is just a totally emotionally a less stressful way to uh, approach it yeah yeah so one you know one parent the alternative is one parent is angry and the other one parent is is panicked and the other parent is angry and right. which par which parent took which role on any at any given time varied <laughs> M, M said why wait until bedtime to tidy mother put things away as part of getting up from the chair process mm -hmm. finish eating take dishes the kitchen when standing up finished hand sewing put it back in the basket before leaving the chair and that's all about, and when you finish the project, you have to do your own wrap up and clean up where you're with what you've been working on. And that's yeah. exactly right. That's what Allocate you're describing. Allocate that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Project cleanup is something that we don't budget well. We don't put it into our time. And if you're having, particularly if you're having fun, you want to keep having fun until you have fun until you run out of energy and then you don't have any cleanup time energy to go. And so- um, stopping yourself a little bit before you run out of steam and doing a little cleanup on the way out is how you keep your space manageable. Kimber says, I'm teaching my dog to reset every, every night he has to put his toys back in the basket. Do you hear that? Hardy? <laughs> Do you hear that? You... Hardy's like, I'm not, yeah, I'm not playing that game. I'm not sorry. taking any hits. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I will say this, there's a, for the people that are, you know, I have a bunch of crafty friends and we all have, um, either dedicated spaces or we bead in front of the television in a com in a common area like we're discussing. Um, somebody's doing uh, craftiness in front of the TV. And so if you have a permanent station in the in the common area where you're doing crafts, I think it becomes really important to build in more reset time, having chaos, at your art station um, is not easily recoverable when somebody comes. And so I don't know how badly it bothers you when friends come over and see the chaos that is your craft area. Um, if it's a problem, then um, building in regular time for cleanup and reset, even though the project's not complete, putting things away, um, being able to lift up the tray you're working on and going and putting it on a bookshelf um, having a box that you put things back into at the end of the day and cultivating the habit, as Ed said earlier, of putting everything to bed at night in a parking space and then unpacking it again when you sit back down the next day. I know it seems like a waste of energy, but it creates that awareness of how the project is spreading. If you have to keep putting it back every night, then you throw trash away and you put stuff up that you're no longer using and you don't let it slowly creep into an ever be bigger pile if you are resetting every night and parking things that are unfinished um, out of the way. And then it means that it's unless you're actively sitting there, it's parked. And so if somebody comes over, they don't come over to the bomb went off craft area in your 
common area. It's just something to think about in terms of managing. If you're going to share that space with a hobby, then you have to sort of increase your level of, of space management to go with the fact that there's an active hobby in there. Well, there's a good defensive reason too for proper uh, you know, tidying up after, which is if you don't want your super fancy, expensive left-handed sewing scissors to to end up being used for by right-handed people to cut construction paper, then you'll want to put them away where they're they're not visible Nobody or readily can get to accessible. Them. <laughs> and you know, there's a bunch of crafters out there going, yes, 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 because you know you can spend some money on some serious scissors, and then how annoying when somebody comes and uses it for the, not their intended purpose. And so uh, again, a good reason to go and put your tools up when you're done with them so that it's not so easy for them to get to them. Um, one more thing I'll say about this room and then we should go on to the next thing. But the, yes. the last thing that you should do related to a common area is that there's always a common area bathroom. There's the one bathroom that the guests are going to use. And so this is the bathroom that you should set up like it's a hotel bathroom. And it doesn't have a bunch of stuff stored in it and it needs to be super easy to keep it clean. And so you don't want extra, you don't want to use it as a sport storage space. You don't want a bunch of stuff on the counter. You don't want all the drawers filled with things. You don't want all that happening in there. You want this to be a very pristine bathroom that has nothing going on and you go in and you can keep it clean so that you feel comfortable about when somebody says, oh gosh, I need the restroom, you can point them to the restroom and not die inside about what the bathroom looks like when they go in there. So sometimes people have a half bath that's easily accessible by guests. Maybe it's the bath in the front of the house. It's not attached to any kind of a bedroom. And so what you do in your private areas and the bathrooms that the family's using in the back of the house or on another floor, that's y'all's business. But the bathroom that is, you know, that's off the living room that you're going to send people to, that bathroom needs to be something that doesn't make you wince and blush and, you know, be super embarrassed when they go in there. So um, when you're tidying and resetting the living room, you also need to be checking on that bathroom and making sure it's okay. Now, clearly the family members are going to be using it too, but make sure that it stays clean. If you're not cleaning any other bathroom, you need to be cleaning this bathroom, scrubbing this toilet, wiping this counter down so that the, you know, the guests are not going, oh my God, this room is gross when they go in there. That is, to me, that's the worst. Like if you go in the bathroom, like I go in the client's bathrooms all the time. And a lot of times those bathrooms are scary to me and so I, I have to I have uh, been in those bathrooms where it's made me uncomfortable to be there and um, uh, I know what it feels like to be the guest in the house looking at the bathroom and going really wish they'd clean this toilet <laughs> <laughs> and so just to, you know think that what would it be like what is it like for you when you go in somebody else's bathroom in their house and make sure that bathroom is clean for them I'm okay sure I'm sure that when people know that the clutter fairy is coming over, there's a special level of panic. Right? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't usually spur um, extra cleaning, but it does spur panic. You're correct about that. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't I don't try to actively use the bathrooms in people's places because I know it makes them nervous and uncomfortable. And you know, sometimes the girl's got to go. So. It cannot be avoided. <laughs> right? right? That's the end of it. So we want to be, um, uh, we're going to announce something for you today. We're very pleased to announce that a new book has been published by a member of our own Clutter Fairy community, Carol Niles. Congratulations to Carol on the publication of her book. And it's called The Hoarder's Widow. And she talked to us about it um, in a previous show recently this year. And she um said that it was coming out and she very graciously mailed me a copy. Thank you so much. So she sent me my own copy of the book and I haven't had a chance to read it yet. I just got it last week, but I appreciate you, Carol, sending me this book and we put a link out to it somewhere, right? Yeah. Um, the Hoarders Widow by Carol Niles, cfhou.com slash widow, W-I-D-O-W, -W, will link you out to Amazon where the book is being sold. So you can go find it. Thanks for sharing it with us, Carol. Appreciate it. And I hope that the book sells well. It's an interesting, um, it's an interesting story concept talking about um, 
you know, cleaning out after her, her hoarder husband passed away and what she learned from the process. And I think it will be fascinating reading. So okay. thanks for sharing it with us. I've put it on my list as well. I, I right? will go for the, go for the ebook. Okay. Let's talk about next week. I hope everyone, everyone seems to be enjoying our recent model of going through the house and, and changing up what we've done before with the addition of surveys to, to sort of unpack what's going on in, Some more details. in the world out there of our audience. And we're going to do the same thing again next week. We're going to move on to the master bedroom. This is the room that we all dream of having as our peaceful sanctuary, sanctuary. Our, our oasis, <laughs> whatever. And it often falls short for a variety of reasons. So that's what we'll be back to talk about next week and watch your email for a survey link um, tomorrow or Thursday. We'll get that out. We'll get that out to you. Thanks again for answering the surveys. We've consistently had um, at 100 responses to the surveys. And so yeah, we're getting more. a rich level of detail and a great uh, suggestions from everybody and great insight into what we're talking about. So we really appreciate that you're participating. Well, and lots of terrific topic suggestions too for digging a little deeper into things we talked about before. And even uh, it's hard to believe after we've been doing this for uh, 13 years. A long time. That once in a while, we still come up with a completely brand new topic. <laughs> right. And somebody suggested this week um, in the surveys, um, uh, car clutter, that we, they want us to talk about car clutter. So that's fascinating. I think we can talk about managing the car clutter. Yeah. That'll be a good one coming up. Okay. Would you like to tell us about this week's tittle? This week's tittle is called Make the Common Area Special. This week's assignment is to examine a common area in your home and work towards optimizing it for the use of you, your family, and your guests. So first off, you want to select a common area of your home that isn't working the way you'd like it to. For example, the living room where you'd like to entertain guests, but you're not ready to do so. Then we want to make a list of the purposes for which you would like this space to be used. So what do you want to be able to do in there? For reference, you might also brainstorm a list of functions that you would explicitly prefer not to do there. So the list of, I definitely want to be able to do this in here, and I absolutely don't want to do this in here. Just or to don't give want you some, anyone else doing this in yeah, here. Right, or anybody else, so that you can um, have some idea of what you're aiming for here. So then go into that area and search for anything that is parked or stored in this room that doesn't actually get used there and assign each of those type of items, a new place somewhere else in the house to go or set it aside to consider donation or disposal. This is where you go into the living room, the common area, and you say, what has landed in here that really doesn't make sense here? That really has nothing to do with what we're doing in this room. Let's pull it out. Let's park it somewhere else. Um, we, like we talked about the collections Maybe you have a whole bunch of something and they're taking up a lot of room and they're visibly very busy. Maybe you want to put a slice of it in the room and pack away the rest of it somewhere else or display it somewhere else so that there's not as much going on in the living room. Um, maybe there's furniture that got parked there because you inherited the table or the chair came home from college or whatever. And there's things in that room that just landed there that don't need to be there. So this is where you look at that room with a fresh eye and find anything that shouldn't be there and get it out. Also assess the furniture in the room in terms of its usefulness and necessity. You're trying to reduce the congestion in the room by removing anything that isn't serving an important or essential function. So is that chair really one that people like to sit in or is it just there because there was no place else to put it? Maybe it's time for it to go. Is that table up against the wall because we inherited it from grandma and we didn't know what to do with it? then maybe it's time to let it go. Like this is a place where you don't want a bunch of extra furniture. And so <clears throat> evaluate it all and make sure it really needs to be there. And then lastly, in your tittle today, um, look at any secondary activity that you have to do in this room. Like if you're doing, you're paying bills in there, you don't really want your guests to come and sit amongst the shrapnel that is you paying your bills. So Let's design a storage solution that allows you to stash those materials away 
when you actually have guests over, when you're sitting down to dinner, when you are um, watching television and not paying the bills, you don't want all that stuff just laying out. And so let's find a place to, here's a, a storage container, here's a bookshelf, here's a create your parking space. Maybe there's a closet in that room and you can go set up a, a station inside the closet to put things away when you're not doing it. Just consider what activity you have to do in that room occasionally that you don't want laying out all the rest of the time to be in the way, to be destroyed, to be, you know, food poured on it <laughs> or to be visible when the guests show up. What, what activity falls in that category and how can you park it differently so that it's out of the way until you actually are doing it and see if you can't reset your living room to something that will make you not cringe when the guests come over because it's so much fun when they come over and talk to you and are nice to you and you guys have lovely conversation and share time and I know we are definitely out of the habit of doing that COVID got us out of the habit of randomly showing up at people's houses and visiting and so you need that in your life you need to get it back in your life and let's make the living room reset to receive those people and you can get back in the practice of it doing it. I want to remind our viewers and listeners who are with us live that we have a YouTube channel with more than 200 videos on a wide variety of organizing topics. Visit cfhou.com slash YouTube. You can find our playlists on there and we we're working on, we haven't really evaluated the whole library yet, but every week I evaluate a couple more videos to put them in playlists so that they're kind of organized by topic topic or room or there are about 400 no we don't have that many videos there are many many videos where we talk about habits and behaviors but <laughs> right okay um we're just about out of time if you're watching this on youtube we'd love for you to join us live to get notifications about upcoming events we invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by visiting cfhou.com slash Facebook or subscribe to our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We'd love to hear from you. So please send us your questions, comments, and topic suggestions in YouTube comments on Facebook or anywhere else that you run across us. You can always reach, reach, reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. That is us. Um, we're so glad that you came today. We really appreciate all of the visitors that come from all over the world to join us. And so thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.